Welcome back to our series, Getting the Big Ideas. Uh, we're looking at nine major doctrines that are found in the Bible. I know some people get a little nervous when they hear that word doctrine, uh, because doctrine sounds either dry or controversial. And yet it's important that Christians have a good understanding of what the Bible teaches. And with many of our Bible doctrines, they're not all found in one place in Scripture. Uh, we have to go through the scriptures and gather together the various uh, threads of scripture that lead us to conclusions about what the Bible is teaching us. Uh, so this, as I say, is our third session now. In, a, in this session, uh, we're going to be looking at the doctrine of Christ. We've looked at the doctrine of revelation, uh, that God speaks, uh, ultimately that he has spoken in scripture. We've looked at the doctrine of God, and this time we'll be looking at the doctrine of Christ. And obviously, uh, these first three are probably three of the biggest subjects that are being dealt with. Uh, if you were to ask a child, what's the Bible about? Probably the first answer that they would give is God. The second answer that they would give is Jesus. And, uh, and, and they're right. Uh, all the way through, Old Testament and New Testament, we would, we would be fully convinced uh, that Jesus himself said that all of the scriptures speak about him. So we want to gather these together and see what help we can get from them. Again, just to remind you, these are the three foundational truths that I think that we can build our our understanding of Scripture upon. First of all, there is a God, that God has spoken, and the Bible is God's Word. So we're not just coming up with our own ideas about what we think God is like or what Jesus is like, uh, but we are drawing this upon the authority of God's Word as a trustworthy place, authoritative teaching about uh, all of these important truths. So there's seven major things that we want to consider about the person and work of Jesus. First of all, where do we begin? Secondly, some of the anticipation for his coming. Uh, then looking at his earthly life and ministry, his death, burial, and resurrection, his ascension, exaltation, and present ministry, his return and reign, and then finally his identity. And so these are crucial things that Christians should know and understand, and so let's consider them together uh, rather briefly here. So where do we begin? Well, if you were to ask Matthew where to begin, he begins with the ancestry of the Lord Jesus. Uh, he goes back to Matthew chapter, in Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, he says, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now, in one sense, he is telling us who the ancestors of the Lord Jesus were. But as soon as we hear those expressions, son of David and son of Abraham, we recognize that these are things that are rooted in history and also that these were people to whom significant promises had been made and in, in which covenants had been entered into with them. And so, uh, so Matthew, as he's beginning, is wanting to point us backwards to that and to give us a helpful understanding of where uh, Matthew wants us to understand who the Lord Jesus Christ is and that he is the fulfillment of all of the promises that God has made in times past. Then if we think about Mark, Mark begins with the public ministry of the Lord Jesus. He has nothing, uh, he has, has no record of the genealogy of the Lord Jesus. He has no record of the birth of the Lord Jesus the way that Matthew and Luke would have. He just begins with the Lord Jesus as a full-grown adult, uh, 30 years of age, beginning his public ministry. He tells us in, in Mark chapter 1, he says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So again, not Son of David and son of Abraham now, but son of God, uh, telling us his origin, where he has really come from, that while he is the fulfillment of these other promises, uh, he's telling us that the, the origin of the Lord Jesus is in glory uh, with God. And then he says in verse 14, now after John was put in prison, prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So as, as Jesus begins his preaching ministry, his public ministry, he's preaching about the kingdom. And again, this is language that would have been very familiar to Jewish people uh, who were familiar with the Old Testament, who had looked forward to the time when a kingdom would come, when, when the son of David would sit on a throne and that one of his descendants would rule forever. 
and bring in righteousness and peace. And so the Lord Jesus is speaking of those things and he says the time is fulfilled. Now is the time. The kingdom of God is at hand. So you need to spiritually prepare yourselves, repent, and believe in the gospel. In Luke's gospel, he begins slightly differently with this idea of expectation or anticipation of what's going to happen. This is in Luke chapter 1 and verse 30. We read, Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom. There will be no end. And so again, this idea of expectation. The people had been waiting. Mary, a young Jewish teenager, was familiar with the promises that God had made of a king and a kingdom ruling over the house of Jacob and a kingdom which would never end. And so she is living in expectation of that. We'll find that Zacharias and Elizabeth are living in expectation of that. We'll find uh, that Simeon and Anna in the temple, they were expecting this and they were talking to people. There was other talking to people in Jerusalem who were living in expectation of that time of redemption as well. And so they were living in a time of expectation and the Lord Jesus uh, comes to fulfill those expectations. But John's gospel is quite different. He doesn't begin with the birth of Jesus. He doesn't begin with the public ministry of Jesus. He goes all the way back to the very beginning. And in John chapter 1, we read these famous words, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men. So John is going back to the, to the very beginning. He's talking about a time when this word was the creator of all things, but this word is not an abstract thing, but a person. All things were made through him. And this word, who was in the beginning with God, was God. So again, we see in this expression, we see something of distinction, he was with God, the Word was with God, but also sameness, the Word was God. He, the Lord Jesus, the Word, was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him. Without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And this is going to be one of the major themes that John will develop in his Gospel. The Lord Jesus as the source of life. Here in chapter 1, he's speaking of the Lord Jesus as the source of of natural life first as the creator but it also goes on to speak about those who are born of god having everlasting life and so again he's pointing to what the lord jesus is offering us today eternal life then we go on to this idea of anticipation and again, this is now taking us back into the Old Testament uh, to, to remind ourselves again that all of the scriptures are speaking about the Lord Jesus, anticipating the day when this promised one would come. And the first promise that comes is the seed of the woman. Back in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, that time when uh, Adam and Eve had sinned, they had given in to the temptation that was brought to them by the serpent. And as the Lord, as God, sorry, is, is putting his curse upon this serpent, in the midst of this curse we have hope. We have a promise. And as God speaks to the serpent, he says, And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And so the expectation given to, given to Eve and to Adam there in the garden was that one day one of her descendants, the seed of the woman, would come and would crush, would bruise the head of the serpent. And that was fulfilled at the cross of the Lord Jesus. And so this expectation was there right from the beginning. This expectation was passed on from generation to generation. This was a word of hope that one day a man would come who would be able to destroy the works of the devil. The second promise that is made uh, that we want to look at here is the promise to Abraham. And again, this wonderful promise that is made uh, things have degenerated badly. Sin has gotten worse and worse. Uh, 
Rebellion against God is widespread, and God chooses a man, Abraham, calls him to leave his home in Ur of the Chaldees, and he makes this promise to him in, in Genesis chapter 12. He says, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And so again, remember how Matthew begins his gospel, the son of David, the son of Abraham, going back to this promise that was made to Abraham that a great nation was going to come from Abraham, and that through Abraham and through his descendant, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And so now as the gospel goes out to all the nations, that is because of the promise made to Abraham being fulfilled in the person of the Lord Jesus. We have another promise given to us in Genesis chapter 49 and verse 10. And again, these promises, you'll note, are narrowing the promise. First of all, the seed of the woman, there's going to be a man who's going to come. The promise made to Abraham it's going to be one of your descendants, Abraham, who is going to be this promised one. Now it's going to be narrowed down, not just from, from one of Abraham's descendants, but from one of Judah's descendants. In Genesis chapter 49 and verse 10, we read, The scepter, that symbol of rulership and authority, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. Genesis chapter 49 is where Jacob is approaching death. He has called his 12 sons together. He is laying before them various prophecies, anticipating blessings that will come upon them and problems that they're going to face. Uh, but to, to the, his son Judah, he is saying, from your tribe, from the tribe of Judah, this ruler is going to come, a lawgiver, and he's going to be Shiloh. He's going to be peace when he comes. And to this one, this descendant of yours, the one who holds the scepter, shall be the obedience of the people. And so it's that promise of rulership and kingship coming to the, to the line of Judah. And so many years later, born into the tribe of Judah, was David. And, and this David was, was a man after God's own heart. And because of his faithfulness in serving God, because of his heart to serve, because of his desire to honor God by building God a temple, God says, I'm going to make a house for you. And he says in Second Samuel chapter 7, When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you, who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So here's this promise being made to David. After you have died, one of your descendants, I'm going to establish his kingdom, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And again, when you come to Matthew chapter 1, the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And so narrowing down these promises of the seed, the seed of the woman, the seed of Abraham, the seed of Judah, the seed of David. Again, making it more and more specific and only can find ultimately its fulfillment in the Lord Jesus. But not only are there promises that are made, there are prophecies that are made. And uh, there's so many, uh, we don't have time to look at them all, uh, but just a couple of samplings. We know that the sufferings of the Lord Jesus are very clearly predicted in the Old Testament. To read Psalm 22, written by David a thousand years before the birth of Christ, and yet so clearly portray his crucifixion. Those famous words uttered by the Lord Jesus on the cross are the opening words of Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And we come to that very familiar passage in Isaiah chapter 53, prophesying that he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. And so these these prophecies of the suffering that the Lord Jesus would, fu will, would fulfill and endure are, are spoken of in the Old Testament in many, many passages. But not only does it speak of his sufferings, it also speaks of his glory. And passages like Psalm 72 and Daniel 7 uh, speak of this great hope and expectation uh, that will come. Let's look at this one here in Haggai chapter 2. Uh, For thus says the Lord of hosts, once more, it is a little while, I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and dry land, 
and I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations, and I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts, and in this place I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. Haggai is written at a time after the Babylonian captivity, when the temple that Solomon had built had been utterly destroyed by the Babylonians. They've come back now after 70 years of Babylonian captivity. The temple is being rebuilt, but it seems so small and insignificant compared to Solomon's. And yet the promise that the Lord of hosts, the God of heaven, is making is that he is going to He's going to do something amazing. He's going to shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations, and I will fill this temple with glory. Now, again, in the context, it would appear, first of all, that he's talking about a physical building that he is anticipating. But when we come to a passage like John chapter 2, where the Lord Jesus goes into the temple that Herod was building, and had been building for 46 years, and he said, destroy this temple, and in three days I, I will raise it up again. And they thought, it's taken 46 years to build this temple, how can you raise it in three days? But he is speaking of his body, and speaking of the resurrection, because it's the Lord Jesus himself who is the desire of all nations. And God filled the Lord Jesus with glory. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Son, full of grace and truth. And the glory of this latter temple, the, the glory of the Lord Jesus, will be far greater than any physical temple that was ever made by man. But we also have this precious promise in Zechariah chapter 6. Then speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold, the man whose name is the branch, from his place he shall branch out, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Yes, he shall build the temple of the Lord. He shall bear the glory, and shall sit and rule on his throne. So he shall be a priest on his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. David, the great king, his line was destroyed, and Isaiah spoke of him as being a stump, or his line as being a stump that had been cut off. And yet out of the stump of Jesse, uh, David's father, out of the stump of Jesse, there was going to be a branch that would come out, seemingly dead, dead for hundreds of years. And yet out of that stump was going to come a branch who would rebuild the temple of the Lord. And he is the one who's going to be glorious. He's going to one who's going to bear the glory. He's going to one who's going to sit on the throne and rule forever. And so again, a wonderful prophecy about the glory that one day the Lord Jesus will display. Promises, prophecies, but also pictures. And again, as we go through the Old Testament, there are, are so many pictures that are given to us of the Lord Jesus. These are just a couple of examples. Again, the Passover lamb, uh, one that was without blemish and without spot, uh, who would be killed, his blood applied to the door, uh, so that when the angel of death came over, those within the house would be protected. The, the angel or, or, or the Lord himself would hover over, would, would pass over that home to protect those who were within it. And the Lord Jesus was our Passover lamb. Paul would tell us that Christ, our lamb, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. And, and John the Baptist would say, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And we know that these chapters of, of Exodus, chapters 25 to 40, give us this full-length portrait of the Lord Jesus as we look at the tabernacle and all the pictures that point towards him. So these are just some of the ways in which the Old Testament anticipates uh, the coming of the Lord Jesus and some of his functions and some of his work that he will do. But then we have the four Gospels that record for us his earthly life and ministry. And they begin with the incarnation. And again, that's a word that can only truly be spoken of concerning the Lord Jesus. Uh, because the Lord Jesus pre-existed, because according to John chapter 1 and verse 1, he was in the beginning with God and was God and made all things and is the source of all life. But that eternal one, became flesh. John chapter 1 and verse 14 says, The Word became flesh 
and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The one who was eternal, the one who was spirit, became flesh, incarnation. And he dwelt among us. Uh, that word dwelt has the idea of pitching his tent, just like the tabernacle in the Old Testament, where God made himself known in the midst of his people. Now God is once more making himself known in the midst of his people in flesh and blood, in the person of the Lord Jesus, the God-man. Uh, truly God, truly man, unique in all of history, and so significant because of that. And he is the glorious one, who has the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So the Gospels begin with the incarnation of the Lord Jesus. Uh, we have these promises that are given to us in the Old Testament in Isaiah chapter 7 that speak of the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus, and these things uh, are spoken of again in Matthew's Gospel. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Joseph was not too sure about all of this, but an angel comes and speaks to him and says, So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. And so this child, born in Bethlehem, in such poverty, in such weakness, in such utter dependence upon Mary and Joseph, this one is God with us, Emmanuel. Uh, and this virgin birth uh, is a, a powerful promise made in the Old Testament, uh, but of great significance as well, because it means that this child who was born was truly the seed of a woman and not the seed of a man. She was, she was descended from, or he was descended from, from this, this woman, Mary. Joseph had not had had not come together with Mary yet. They had not had any sexual relationships, uh, but she was found to be with child of the Holy Spirit. A miraculous birth uh, confirmed for us from the Old Testament. And then we have uh, just the wonder of his sinless life. Uh, this truly is remarkable. We know how sin is so much a part of our life. It is so much uh, something that we would love to be rid of in our life, and one day as believers we will be fully rid of it. Uh, but as as the New Testament describes the Lord Jesus, it speaks of his sinless life. And so we have, first of all, the words from, from the Apostle Paul, uh, that man of great intellect, uh, who says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, For God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The Lord, the Lord Jesus knew no sin. Uh, we know that sin begins in our heart and our mind, and the Lord Jesus, uh, he had no sin in his mind. Uh, he, he was pure and holy. We also have the, the words of, of Peter, uh, that man of action who was always ready to, to act before he thought. Uh, and yet this man of action, as he speaks of the Lord Jesus, he says that he committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. For three years, Peter had been with the Lord Jesus uh, as much or more than anybody else, that, that inner circle of Peter, James, and John. And yet there was never anything in the life of the Lord Jesus that Peter could point to as, as evidence of sin. He was fully convinced that the Lord Jesus committed no sin. And the Apostle John, that other disciple in that inner circle, he would say, And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. John truly is the one who leaned against the breast of the Lord Jesus. He was a, a man who is known as the disciple whom Jesus loved, and who was so concerned with the inner life, uh, that the fellowship with God, and he, as he listened to the heartbeat of the Lord Jesus, he could say, in him, there is no sin. 
We also have a lot of miracles uh, recorded about the, the Lord Jesus. And this summary is given to us by Peter in his sermon in Acts chapter 2. He says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you, by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. Now, sometimes people would say, well, we look at the miracles of Jesus and they prove that he is God. Well, miracles by themselves do not prove that Jesus is God, but they prove that he was from God, that he was a man of God, but this man of God claimed to be God and claimed that, that he was the great I am, uh, that, that he was the son of God. Uh, and, and so the miracles confirm the truthfulness of what he said. And so God attested to these Jewish people, the Lord Jesus, by all of these miracles, signs of or, or, or evidence of, of power is, is the word behind miracles, wonders is the effect that it has upon people as they're amazed by as they saw the things that Jesus was do was doing and signs that communicate information that are telling us something about who the Lord Jesus actually is. And so these miracles were an important part of the life of the Lord Jesus. But also his teaching was, uh, he, he came to preach, he came to teach, he came to reveal God's heart and mind and to bring new information to us. In John chapter 13, he says to the disciples in the upper room, you call me teacher and Lord and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. It's Interesting to notice that not only was it by the words that Jesus spoke uh, that he was teaching, but by his actions he was teaching. In fact, even many of his miracles, uh, while they were, again, historical events that actually happened, so many of those miracles were intended to teach truth as well. So that as Jesus heals uh, a man who is lame, he, he shows us how to walk again as he brings someone back from from the dead like Lazarus, it's so that we might know uh, that, that we can be brought from death to life spiritually. Uh, and those who were uh, who were blind uh, were able to see. And so these miracles were, were teaching spiritual truth, but they actually happened, uh, attesting who the Lord Jesus was. Uh, but again, they uh, show us that he is a great teacher. And then the Lord Jesus would have also emphasized the idea of discipling. We see it in his ministry that he chose those 12 disciples to be with him and to learn from him. But the teacher wants others to teach now that he is gone. And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And so the Lord Jesus was himself a teacher, uh, but he wanted those who were uh, preaching the gospel to teach others as well. But in many ways, uh, the heart of the gospel stories is the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And while these uh, events, uh, his death, burial, and resurrection, all happen within three days of each other, probably 25% of the Gospels or more are taken up with his with the final week of his life and the events of his resurrection. And so they are at the very heart of, of why Jesus came. They are they are part of his 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 mission, his destiny, his ministry for which he came. And so we again have seen some of the predictions made in Isaiah chapter 53. In Matthew 16, uh, the Lord Jesus to the twelve, uh, as he is, as uh, they have spoken of who he is, that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Then it says, from that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. None of that took the Lord Jesus by surprise. Uh, he knew the scriptures. He knew why he was born. And so uh, Luke's gospel emphasizes that he was constantly moving towards Jerusalem, knowing that that was the place where he would suffer and then be received up into glory. And so it's at the very heart of his purpose for coming. So his death was predicted. His death was necessary. Again, 
um, in Luke chapter 24, uh, following uh, his resurrection during this time where he has been uh, teaching and instructing his disciples in preparation for his ascension to glory. Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. So this, was, again, was not something that took the Lord Jesus by surprise. Uh, these things were part of the plan of God. Uh, elsewhere we read of the Lord Jesus that he was uh, slain from before the foundation of the world. So certain was his death uh, that it was it was planned in eternity and in God's mind completed in eternity, although it didn't happen until the end of his three years of public ministry. But it was necessary for him to suffer. It was necessary for him to rise again the third day. And then we also see that his death was vicarious. By vicarious, we mean in place of another. He didn't die because of his own sins. He died for somebody else. In Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 11, it says, He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. When the Lord Jesus went to the cross, he was bearing our iniquities. And because he has borne our iniquities, we can be justified. We can be declared righteous. Uh, Mark chapter 10 and verse 45, the Lord Jesus says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So again, long before he is put to death by the Romans, uh, seemingly at the, uh, at the because of the weakness of Pilate, seemingly because of the envy of the Jews and the, and the mob getting all riled up, and yet the Lord Jesus had come to give his life as a ransom for many. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24, it says, Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree. That was the purpose that the Lord Jesus came, to bear our sins, to bear the penalty for our sins, so that he might justify those who have faith in him. And we also recognize that his burial was necessary. Matthew chapter 12 says, Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and an adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. This was prophetic. This was a sign, the sign of the prophet Jonah. And the Lord Jesus needed to do that. It, again, it was going to be a confirmation of the reality of his death, uh, that he was dead and buried, and he was there for three days. But on the third day, he rose again. And then we also recognize that his resurrection uh, was necessary. And again, we read these words again from Peter on that great sermon on the day of Pentecost. Him, the Lord Jesus, being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. And so, again, in Peter's mind, the death of the Lord Jesus was necessary. It was God determined it before that Christ would die for our sins. But he's also not letting these people off the hook. You have taken him by lawless hands have crucified and put to death. But God had the last word. He raised him up because it was not possible that the Lord Jesus be held uh, by, by the grave. And so his resurrection was necessary as well. But following his resurrection, uh, we find his ascension and his exaltation and his present ministry as well. And so again, this was not something that was done in a hidden way. Uh, we, we read in Acts chapter 1 of this visible bodily resurrection. He had, been, he had proven himself alive for 40 days by many infallible proofs, it says earlier in this chapter. But here in verse 9 it says, Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, 
and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who is taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So bodily he was ascended into heaven, bodily he will return. The same Jesus, glorified, powerful, uh, and, and it will be a remarkable thing. And, and when he comes, uh, they will see him, the one that they pierced. So his, his ascension was visible. It was a bodily resurrection. And having been ascended, he is now exalted above every name. These lovely words in Philippians chapter 2 remind us, Therefore God also has highly exalted him because of his willingness to leave the glories that he had once enjoyed in heaven and to condescend to become a man and had humbled himself and become obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. God is delighted, God is glorified when we confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. The Old Testament tells us that there is only one Lord. The New Testament tells us that Jesus Christ is Lord and God is glorified when we acknowledge him and when we exalt him the way that God has exalted him. Now that he is there in heaven, seated at the right hand of the majesty on high, his present ministry is as a high priest. Yes, Christians, as, a, as, as New Testament believers, we have a priesthood. But Christ is our high priest. He is our representative. He's the one who goes into the very presence of God on our behalf. And Hebrews 4 uh, tells us, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The Lord Jesus, because of his incarnation, because he has been where we have, because he has suffered in this life, he's able to sympathize with us. He never sinned in all of his temptations. But he understands what it is to be tempted because he has been tempted, because he has been tired, because he has been hungry, because he has been thirsty. He understands because he's been misunderstood. He understands all of those things. So now we can come to our high priest, the one who is seated at the right hand of the majesty on high, and he is the one who will make sure that we obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. He is the one who represents us before his father and who is so sympathetic towards us. But he also continues in his present ministry as the head of the church. Uh, he had said that I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. On the day of Pentecost, as the Lord Jesus, the risen glorified Lord Jesus, as he poured out the Holy Spirit, began the church, baptizing people in the Holy Spirit, placing them into the body of Christ. And this body of Christ, this church universal, the Lord Jesus is head over all. Ephesians chapter 1 says, And he, God, put all things under his feet. The Father put all things under the Son's feet, and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So the Lord Jesus is the head. We are the body. He fills us up. He fills us out. He, he, he gives us all of our fullness and our completeness. And he is the head, and we need to look to the head and follow the directions of the head. Colossians 1 similarly says, He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. And as believers, again, we need to make sure that in our lives individually and in our local churches collectively, that we give that place of preeminence to the Lord Jesus alone that there is none who competes with him for glory, that there is none who competes with him for headship. He alone is the head. He is alone is the one who guides and directs and is worthy of our, our worship. The promise that we have also, though, is that one day the same Lord Jesus will return 
and he will reign. He does this in order to fulfill prophecies that we have, for instance, in Psalm 2 and Isaiah chapter 11. We don't have time to look at all of these, uh, but we know that one day when he returns, he will establish the mediatorial kingdom of God. Right now, from all, through, from all ages, God has ruled over all. Uh, he has always been on his throne. God has always been sovereign over all. But his intent was that a man would rule this world. Adam failed in that. But God's plan and desire was still that a man would rule. And this same Jesus, who ascended up into heaven, he's going to come back as a real man. The Word made flesh, the incarnate one, the one who is verily God yet become truly human. He is the one who's going to come and establish this mediatorial kingdom of God. Listen to what we read in Revelation chapter 19 about this return in glory of the Lord Jesus. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This same Jesus, this one who was rejected as the Nazarene, this one who had a crown of thorns placed upon his head, and soldiers bowing and mocking and saying, Hail, King of the Jews, that title that was put above him on the cross, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. He is going to come back one day as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He's going to come back to establish this mediatorial kingdom in righteousness and in justice. But in order to do that, he will need to destroy those who have opposed his rule and his reign. And one day, the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. So he's going to come to establish his mediatorial kingdom, and he's also coming back to judge the living and the dead. In John chapter 5 and verse 20, the Lord Jesus says, For the Father loves the Son, and shows him all things that he himself does, and he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. The Father sent his Son not only to be the Savior of the world, but he is the one that he has entrusted all judgment into his care. We read through the Old Testament and over and over again we read that God is the judge of all men. Will not the judge of all men do right? And God is glorified in his judgment, but he has committed all judgment to the Son. He is the one who is going to judge the living and the dead. In the very next, uh, or just a few verses down, in verses 26 and 29, 26 to 29, it says, For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself and has given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. That Son of Man, again, taking us back to Daniel chapter 7, and the promises made that one is going to come like the Son of Man, who's going to sit on the throne and rule forever and bring in righteousness and justice and, and make again the kingdoms of this world, the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. Do not marvel at this. Verse 28, For the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of con condemnation. All men will be raised again, raised for judgment. And those who have trusted in the Lord Jesus and have lived in the good of the righteousness that he has provided for them and have sought to live out that faithfully in their life, they're going to be enjoying the resurrection of life. But those who have rejected the Lord Jesus, gone their own way, ignored his offers of salvation, they will be raised to the resurrection of condemnation. Second Timothy, likewise, this is at the end of Paul's earthly ministry, not long before his death. 
And he speaks to Timothy and he says, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead, at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Timothy was to do that because one day the Lord Jesus is going to come back. And one day when he comes back, he will judge those who are still living at the time and those who have already died at his appearing and his kingdom. And so that's something that we need to be very much aware of. Finally, we want to just think a little bit about his identity. We've obviously touched on it all through everything that we have said, but it really is the heart of what we mean in the doctrine of Christ. We need to understand who the Lord Jesus is. And we've mentioned so many of these things before, so let's just summarize them quickly as we come to an end. He is the Word of God in John chapter 1 and verse 1, the Logos, uh, the one who is uh, the creative power of God, the one who is... Uh, the one who reveals God as the Word of God, uh, he is the Word of God. In uh, Titus chapter 2, he's referred to as the Savior, uh, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. Powerful words. Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. The one who is our Savior, Jesus Christ, is also our great God, according to the Apostle Paul. He's not talking about two people, he's talking about one person, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So he is our Savior. Uh, he will also be the judge of those who have not trusted in him and received the salvation that he has come to offer. So he is the Savior. He is also the Redeemer. He is the one who has paid the price by the blood that he shed on the cross. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom. God has been so good. The Lord Jesus has been so good, making provision for us, redeeming us as our kinsman redeemer, entering into our humanity, becoming one of us to be our kinsman so that he has the right to redeem us. But the cost of it was the shedding of his own precious blood. He's also spoken of as a prophet, uh, one who brings the word of God. And there had again been an anticipation based on a prophecy made to, 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 or made by Moses that one day one like him would come again. And in John chapter 6 and verse 14, we read, Then those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, This truly is the prophet who is to come into the world, the one whose word they were to obey, according to that uh, prophecy made uh, by Moses. And then in Acts chapter 3, we read, For Moses truly said to the fathers, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you. And it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. And so again, there is salvation and there is judgment. Will we accept him as Savior or will we face his judgment? Uh, every soul who will not hear that prophet, who will not listen to the Lord Jesus, shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. And then he's also spoken of as our priest, our high priest. We've made reference to this already from Hebrews chapter 4. Again, in Hebrews chapter 8, the author says, Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary, and of the true tabernacle which the Lord erected and not man. The tabernacle that Moses was instructed to have made in the wilderness was a picture. Moses was told when he went up onto the mountain, make sure that you make it like the pattern that you have seen. He saw the real thing in heaven. And the Lord Jesus is the one who, who doesn't minister in an earthly tabernacle, but in a heavenly temple, in the true sanctuary, in the very presence of God. Uh, erected by the Lord and not by men. He is our high priest. And then as we've seen already, he is our king, uh, the one who was rejected. As men said, we will not have this man to rule over us. But again in Revelation chapter 17, though these will make war with the lamb and the lamb will overcome them for he is Lord of lords and king of kings and those who are with him are called, chosen 
and faithful. Are we with him or are we against him? He's the Lord of Lords. He is the King of Kings. He's coming to establish that kingdom and he will rule forever and ever. He's also spoken as, as the Son of God in Luke chapter 22 and verse 70. Then they all said, Are you then the Son of God? So he said to them, You rightly say that I am. The priests tore their clothes when he made that statement. They understood that his claiming to be the Son of God was a claim of equality to God. Not that he was a miniature God, not that he was like God in some way, but that he shared the very nature of God. He was of the essence of God. Uh, distinct from the Father, as we saw in John chapter 1 and verse 1, he was with God and he was God. Sameness, distinction, part of that Trinitarian formula that we know about God and we've spoken of previous, in previous sessions. Yes, he is the Son of God, and the Lord Jesus acknowledges it before them. John chapter 5 and verse 25, Most assuredly I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. That powerful voice that brought this world into existence is the same voice that will raise people from the dead, and those who hear will live. And then... He is not only the Son of God, but we would like to say that he is God the Son. John chapter 1, verse 1, we've quoted it already. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 18 says, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. He has made him manifest. He has made him visible. He who has seen me has seen the Father. That is one of the great functions of the Son, is to make the invisible God visible, so that we can know him and we can understand him. He did it in the Old Testament, revealing the Father. He did it in his incarnation, and he continues to do it for us in our hearts and lives each day. No one has seen God at any time, the only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father. He has declared him. This same Jesus the same Jesus is the Word of God, the Savior, the Redeemer, the Prophet, the Priest, the King, the Son of God, God the Son. He is our, He is my Lord, and He is my God.